Thank you, Monica. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to be uh, fulfilling this, this role. And one of the reasons why I feel so honored and privileged to do this is the great panelists uh, that we have with us. Uh, as you know, we're going to be talking about uh, covering the campaigns uh, this year uh, on various levels and in various places across the country and in this state. Uh, and to help us do so, as Monica said, is uh, three Associated Press uh, reporters. To my immediate left is uh, Jonathan Cooper, who covers politics focused on Arizona and the Southwest, as well as third-party presidential campaigns. I have a feeling that'll come up uh, in our conversation today. Uh, he's now based in Phoenix uh, after stints in other AP bureaus and after graduating from ASU and the Cronkite School in 2009, and I can't uh, uh, end this introduction without also mentioning that Jonathan was a student of mine uh, more than a couple of years ago, so welcome back. Uh, uh, next to him is Michelle Price. Uh, she is a national po political reporter covering this year's presidential campaign with a focus on, guess who, Donald Trump. Before joining AP's national political team, she covered politics in New York City and New York State. Before that, she was a reporter in Las Vegas, Utah, and here in Arizona. And she, too, is a Cronkite School graduate. Uh, and on my far left is Stephen Sloan. He is the Deputy Washington Bureau Chief and Political Director at the Associated Press. He oversees coverage of national politics, elections, and democracy, just those small issues. He joined AP from CNN, where he was the director of enterprise reporting in the Washington Bureau. He also helped manage the network's digital coverage of politics during the 2016 campaign. And he has also worked at Politico and Bloomberg News. Sadly, he is not an ASU or uh, Cronkite School the only graduate, one up here. <laughs> uh, but earned his degree at Georgia State University. By the way, later on, uh, we'll be happy to take questions from, from you folks. As you can see, there's a microphone set up here in the center aisle. Uh, so when that time comes, if you would step up to the, to the mic and uh, share your questions uh, with us. So again, thank you uh, all and, and welcome. Uh, let's start uh, broadly. We are here in mid-April in a presidential election year. Where are we going? And I mean that from the perspective of not just politics, but also reporting on it and the challenges that the current landscape brings to the process. <laughs> Where are we going? I'll, I'll just start broadly, but then the two of you should jump in. You're, you're out there on the campaign trail every day. You know, I would say this is my third campaign in a managerial role, and this is the most dynamic campaign that I have been around, um, you know, which is really saying something because it's not like the, the past two presidential elections were, you know, uh, easy. But, um, you know, we are dealing with, uh, you know, uh, what you would often, there's kind of the, the, the stuff that you always deal with, the, you know, what each campaign is focusing on each day, but we have a trial uh, of one of the nominees that's uh, beginning this week in New York. We um, have third party candidates that JJ is covering that we'll be following to see whether those uh, candidates are, are going to play more of a role than, than what we've seen uh, in, in some of the past cycles. Um, we have issues kind of coming to the fore right here in Arizona with uh, abortion, um, immigration. Uh, there's just a lot kind of in the soup right now. Uh, and so um, I think we try to approach every day with an open mind uh, and a lot of humility because we truly don't know uh, at, at the end of the day where where this is going to take us. There, there's so much kind of swirling around out there right now. I, I think just to add on that, there's so much that we have not seen before. Um, this is the first time in modern history that we've had two former well, there'll be an incumbent and a former president. We've got two records to compare uh, for the presidential campaign, which we just haven't seen. We've got one on trial, which we've never seen. So there's all these factors that we're just every day kind of evaluating. How do we approach this? What are we not thinking about? What could be coming down the pipe as we try to prepare to cover this election, which is unlike, the, you know, they're always different, but this one is very much unlike any other that we've seen before. 
Yeah, it's hard to <clears throat> really add to that other than um, it, it takes a lot. I mean, all presidential campaigns take take nimbleness, if that a word, um, but you know, adaptability. Um, because you know, we started the year thinking there were going to be you know three or four potential criminal trials. Now it might just be one before the election, and um, campaigning for um, President Trump has to shift to when he's not in court, and you just have to be ready for um, for all of that. And it you know it's um, it's a it's a challenge, but it it's um, doable. We will certainly come back to a lot of the, those uh, those points that, that you mentioned, but for now, let, let me follow up by asking: How does that uniqueness, the the, the first time uh, experience of uh, of a lot of things in the mix, how is that impacting uh, your reporting and the journalism in general? I think it's something we always keep front of mind, and I think we're trying to be cognizant of not using, I think we had a discussion the other day about, we're using the word unprecedented too many times in the story because there's just so many things we've never seen before. Um, but I think it's an opportunity. There's a lot to explain to people why we're here, why this is gonna play out the way it, it is, what systems are in place that are gonna force this to shape, you know, the, whether it's the criminal trial, whether there are rules in place that prevent a someone with a criminal conviction from being a nominee, is that allowed? Like there's, there's all these reporting lines we can explore and explain this to people, things that we, did, we ourselves don't know the answers to, but we are learning as we try to tackle these questions and explain it to everybody. And we're becoming um, much more adept at uh, court reporting than we, <laughs> 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 yeah. than we were before. Yeah, I used to think that my job was just to get us to 270 electoral votes, and uh, and now that it, is, it is far more complicated than that. But you know, I think one of the things just to add to that, uh, you know, when we're dealing with all of the, the swirl of, of things that we're talking about, um, there's a lot of communication between all of us as a team, to where we're talking. You know, um, is this weird? And what do you think about this? I, I, I think when we're in this situation where we're just dealing with so many kind of storylines that we haven't worked through before. Nobody is an expert on this. Nobody knows how to cover, you know, uh, nobody is an expert on how to cover a major party nominee who's on trial, right? So the only way that we can do that is to rely on each other, to talk to each other. Um, you know, I may be kind of the manager involved, but JJ and Michelle are going to have ideas that I'm not coming to the plate with every day and vice versa. And it's that kind of give and take that I think, um, you know, is a healthy news, makes for a healthy newsroom in this moment. And are you suggesting that that sort of uh, communication and bouncing ideas off colleagues is uh, ramped up because of the uniqueness of the current situation? I, I would say it is. I think we're also just talking to more experts than we ever do. And we're talking to sources about what are we missing? What are we not thinking about as you're going through this for the first time, as you're exploring this? What are, what are you preparing for? There's just, it's kind of like when you tackle any subject as a reporter that you don't know. You start asking questions. You start consulting experts. Uh, we're just doing it on a grander scale and at a greater speed than we might be used to here. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we talk a lot about like what are the potential outcomes or what wh where could this story be going so that we're prepared for that and you know that's always part of campaign reporting. Um, you know, this certainly has some new dynamics that we you know have no precedent for. I think one of the you know biggest mistakes that you can make as a journalist is is to kind of assume certainty that you just know everything right and and um, that's one of the things that you know I think we've kind of. I've checked myself on over the years, and, and we all do that, and and uh, that's where these this this kind of the relationships and the the questioning and and all talking it out loud, you know, I I think really comes into play because it helps check any assumptions that you might be coming to, you know, well we know that this is how a, ca a court case works, or we know that clearly, you know, this issue is going to sway th this way, we we don't know that right, and, and I think we're kind of constantly checking our assumptions. One thing that maybe surprisingly hasn't come up yet is social media and the role that it plays. So I, I'm wondering, again, admittedly a broad question, but uh, if you could address that for a bit, uh, not only, again, how it affects uh, the politics and the campaigning and, and, and what you've seen in that regard, but how it affects your work. Uh, well, social media has been um, a, a big, important part of um, campaigns going back a couple of cycles, but what's different 
this year, what, at least what feels different to me is it's it's becoming much more fractured. You know, the um, uh, Twitter has lost or X has lost a huge portion of its audience. Um, people are posting on there less. It's getting sort of more ideologically fractured with a lot of, um, you know, Trump with Trump himself and a lot of his supporters congregating on Truth Social. Um, it you have to um, be in a lot more digital places, uh, just like you know physical places as well, um, and uh, I, 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 that's a big change that I've noticed. Yeah, I would say uh, social media is a tool for reporters, but it is not gospel. It is not representative of the public at large. Like there's a lot of people who are not on social media or they're on social media, but they're not posting. There's people who vote and might be on social media, but they only follow sports accounts. They're not following or commenting on politics. I think from a, from a political reporter perspective, it's a great way to track what other political reporters are reporting on and the loudest voices on each side are there and they're, that's a way to track their perspective but I think it's just important to keep in mind that it's a slice of the American populace. And like any reporting, you have to go out and talk to real people, talk to them about how they're feeling and where are they getting their information. Um, and like JJ said, it's fractured now. So a lot of people on TikTok, I don't think any of, are we on TikTok? I don't know if you're on TikTok. I was on TikTok, but there are people who get their information on TikTok. And so we have to watch that to see how are they consuming information, how are the campaigns using TikTok, how are candidates and politicians using TikTok, uh, how are they using Truth Social or Parler or whatever other methods they're using to communicate with people. This is how they get their message across. So that's just a way we use to track one slice of the messaging in the political cycle. And on TikTok specifically, you know, it's easy to search Twitter for something specific. Um, it's relatively easy to search Facebook, um, but TikTok's, searching TikTok, um, you know, isn't necessarily going to um, give you a sense of the um, conversation in the same way. Um, and then it's easy to sort of lose perspective, as Michelle was saying, like you, you, you get 20 people commenting on something in your reactions and your mentions and it's like bing 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 on your phone and it it you know it feels like oh this is blowing up my phone keeps binging but it's like this is 20 people or 50 people you know out of, in a country of 330 million people and um you know it's it keeping that perspective is just like you have to constantly rem remind yourself of that and i think remembering that there's a lot of bots that like it is not an organic or truthful representation necessarily of, of the people out there that you need to have a very skeptical eye about the comments and the, peop the personas you're seeing on social media. But it is, it's a helpful tool, but uh, you know, major grains of salt there. Now you mentioned uh, social media use is fractured. Um, I hear the same can be said of the country itself. Uh, fractured, polarized, divided, et cetera. Uh, the, the question is, you know, as journalists, how you deal with that and particularly when one segment of this fractured nation seems to flat out reject what you do. I'll start just kind of broadly saying that I think polarization is a storyline unto itself and um, not necessarily, you know, kind of a clause in a story in a divided nation, that type of thing. Like sometimes the polarization is as much of an issue as kind of other issues that, that we're, we're thinking about on the campaign itself. Uh, so that's that's one way we think about it. And, and I don't know if Michelle or JJ would want to jump in. Um, I would just say that I think when we're out as reporters, uh, it's an opportunity for us to hear those different perspectives, but also you know, as a reporter, you're a representative of the profession. And when you show up and say, well, I am interested in hearing what you have to say. Tell me your story. Tell me what's going on in your life, why you feel the way you do. I think that, I mean, I hope in a little way that can help restore individual confidence in, you know, if this person doesn't trust the media, but they see me here, I want to hear what they have to say. They see me quote them accurately, or at least I hope they feel it's accurate, that, that, that those little pieces will help add up and restore some faith. And um, I think, I don't know if I was telling Stephen this recently, but you know, we get a lot of angry emails, people who think we do things wrong, they think we're idiots, 
but they're reading us. And I think that's something to hold on to. Like, at least, at least they're reading. They're reading all the way down to tell me all the ways I'm stupid. But Including I'm the fact check <laughs> material that you'll include in that yeah. story, right? Which I yeah. often just think, maybe people don't like that story. You know, that's, that's okay. But their eyeballs did see the language related to whatever issue that we're, we're kind of exploring in that story. And I don't know that it's going to change minds. That's not my kind of you know, goal or intent. But maybe it, it's, it sticks in the back of somebody's brain. Yeah, and just like uh, almost like a reporting tactic. But um, when you have such a fractured media landscape, you know, one of the questions that I like to ask a lot is where do you get your information when I'm talking to voters? Um, you know, uh, telling telling me their their views, their opinions on on issues. Like, wh where do you get your information? Are you um, getting it from cable news? Are you getting it from the newspaper? Are you getting it from TikTok or wherever? Um, and it it helps to sort of um, understand these different ecosystems that are out there. And th the information that you're hearing, while it might at time like it, it is objectively not true. It is the whole reality for this person that you're talking to because th their media ecosystem is such that it's all that they're hearing. Um, yeah. Have any of you been, uh, while you're in the field, confronted by a uh, belligerent uh, individual or set of individuals who uh, are either unhappy with anything specifically you've reported or more likely are just unhappy that you're a member of the evil press? I have a couple of times, I mean, not in a way that felt physically threatening, I'll knock on whatever this is. Um, I think the biggest thing is when people are angry, they want to be heard. And, you know, if they don't want to talk to you, that's fine. You can say, that's fine. I wanted your perspective. If you don't want to talk to me, that's great. I'll go talk to someone else. Um, but often at that point, that's when they might say, because you know what? This and this and this and this. And they'll start explaining how they feel about things. And then you stay engaged with them and you talk to them and they can kind of get their perspective out there. I think it can sometimes neutralize the anger because they feel like they are being heard, their perspective is out there, they see you considering it. Um, but it com it's far, f luckily it's far fewer than, than I thought it would be when I, when I started covering this, that I think, at least at this stage, you know, it's early, like ask me again in October, people might be feeling different as the stakes are, are, are a lot closer, but uh, the people who are out right now are excited about their candidates, they're excited to participate, so they're, they're a little more joyful than they might be October, November. Yeah, um, you know, as, as um, time goes on, it certainly, the tension ramps up. Um, the, um, I lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. I'll just jump in and say, you know, one of our organizing principles as, as a team and as an organization is respect for voters. And, um, you know, across the political spectrum, uh, when we're showing up at a rally, we're not there to be confrontational with anybody. We're not there to have a gotcha moment with why and expose them as, you know, idiots or anything like that. That is counter, that is completely counter to how we view our work. And I do think that when you, you know, approach your work that way, uh, you know, hopefully the way you approach your life, right? If you, if you treat people with respect, if you're going in and you're just, really trying to honestly understand where somebody's coming from, what's motivating uh, their decision making, it, it takes the tension away. Yeah, and I was gonna um, say earlier that uh, I've been, you might be surprised at how many people will tell you that um, you and your entire profession are, um, you know, fake and scum and whatever, but they're very nice about it. Um, you know, it's, it's, so you asked about belligerence. Like, I have not personally encountered hardly any belligerence in person. You know, people are much more, um, you know, the, the nastiest emails you can imagine um, and some fairly nasty phone calls. But, um, you know, it, when you engage with somebody face to face, um, you know, they're, us they're almost always very pleasant, even if, you know, they're, they're, telling you that they, they think what you do is terrible. Um, and, you know, I hope that the interaction is humanizing what we do, um, you know, in a, in a way that maybe is, is helpful over the long term.
And sometimes if they say, you know, I don't, I don't want to talk to you, I don't, I don't trust the media, you could say, tell me more about that. Like, tell me about your experience. What, what, what's, you know, inform, informing that? And then they'll, they'll start talking and you'll build a rapport. Um, you know, if they don't want to talk, they don't want to talk. You be respectful and you leave. But, uh, you know, I'm thinking of a voter I met in February who was like, I don't know why I'm still talking to you. And then just kept going and going and going. And, and I was, and I'd ask a little question here or there, but like, this person was holding in a lot and probably had wanted to talk to a journalist for a while. And, She'd give you her name? Uh, he wouldn't give me his name. So I, I didn't, was able to use him in a story, but it was still an interesting perspective of why this person felt the way they did. And when, when I do have somewhat tense interactions, like I, I, try to remember that every voter is equal. Like, um, ev everybody's vote counts exactly once. And, um, you know, the, the, if, if we are not talking to people who hold these negative views of us, like, we are missing a whole segment of the electorate. And I think one other thing I would add is we were talking about how fractured the country seems. One thing you learn covering politics at any level, I mean, we learn this covering, you know, state legislatures, people have more in common than they're willing to admit or than they're aware of. You know, their core basic foundational values that people have. They have kids, they have mortgages, they have concerns about their health care, their concerns about their aging parents. Like, there are more dynamics to people than the way they might put themselves in a box ideologically when they show up with their team, their politician's shirt on, uh, the way they see themselves in when they go to vote that there are other ways to start those conversations and talk about those factors in their lives that kind of move them in a direction politically. And I and think that's a way in to talk to them. And that nuance is just, I think, so critical as we go through the rest of this year that we're not flattening the story to, you know, so-and-so thinks this, but over here. It's, it's, you know, I think as Michelle says, a lot of people are just trying to live their lives and, you know, are not kind of necessarily obsessed with every news cycle. And, and I think that's something to respect as well. Yeah. Like one of the questions I'll ask is, you know, when somebody talks about how they feel about candidates or the city of the country, I'll tell, like, tell me how that's affecting you in your life. And I'm thinking about, I met a woman at a Trump rally in, uh, what month is it, March? It was March, maybe? I don't remember what month. Um, she was talking about inflation. And I said, well, how's that impacting you? And she owns a food truck. And she was telling me the price of the cooking oil she used. It shot up by $80. She's like, I had to double all the prices on my menu. And that's a, that's a concrete way this is impacting her life, it's impacting her business, and it is something she's carrying around with her. She feels like things are not on the right track. This is why she's at this rally. She feels like this is maybe the solution to keep that from happening again. Do you find that this um, approach that you've described, the uh, empathetic, trying to understand everyone, realizing that every vote counts equally, is that of recent vintage, and by that I mean post-2016, or and, and maybe ramped up since then, or as we try to understand what's going on, or do you think that was always in place, even prior to that point? I, 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 uh, 2016 was my first campaign in a, uh, in a managerial role, so quite a campaign to, uh, <laughs> to, to uh, jump off with. I'd like to think that it was, you know, kind of always there, but I, I think that, you know, certainly um, the way I approach my job, uh, it, it, it's sharpened over the years that this is, is more of a priority. And, you know, less in reaction to a particular candidate or anything like that, but just more of like, what do you like and not like about campaign coverage? And I get personally, I mean, I'm somebody who's like a political junkie. This is like what I have centered kind of my professional life around, right? But I get a little worn out by like the up and the down and the inside and the outside. Like this is, politics is ultimately about people, right? And I, I think that we succeed uh, the most when we kind of shift the lens from the candidate and what they're trying to like make us think about every day and more about, more on, more on people. And so to me, that's just like how I've developed in, in my career um, and, and just where my, I, you know, I think where kind of uh, what I find interesting and also where I think um, you know, our audiences are engaging the most. I think, like, I think, I, I feel this way, I think a lot of good journalists, like, are always thinking, they're curious, they want to know, they're just asking questions. Like, usually we're great at cocktail parties, because we'll ask you a lot of questions. Um, I do think we've had to ask more detailed questions of voters and get to know them better, partly because of the media landscape has shrunk so much. Like, 
if you're if you're a national journalist and you're sitting back and looking at a state you don't know well, you in the past might be able to rely on the local reporting that was out talking to voters all the time, and you'd get a really rich perspective of how people felt there. In a lot of communities, they don't have that rich newspaper there anymore. They don't have a lot of local TV news reporters out talking to people. So the, those of us who are still out there and able, or lucky enough to do this work, we have to work a lot harder to get those perspectives because there's just fewer people out there collecting them. One of the uh, many things that I still want to get into is uh, third party candidacies. And, and Jonathan, that's uh, one of your specialties. So uh, I want to ask you about that. Uh, and of course, your colleagues can, can jump in too. Uh, but w what can you tell us about that dynamic this year? And uh, I, I'm inclined to, to ask, it, it seems like so many people think that they are irrelevant, uh, don't really matter. So uh, I ask you, why, why should we think otherwise? Why should we be paying attention? Yeah, well, I think um, that Al Gore and Hillary Clinton would disagree that third party candidates are irrelevant. Um, there are, you know, in, in this particular election, um, you, you've got a rematch of the 2016 election. Voters are um, telling us in, in poll after poll after poll that they are not excited about these two candidates, um, and that is um, opening up uh, a window for um, third party candidates and uh, other movements that, that feel like they can exploit that. Uh, you know, distrust with the um, with the with the two f major party candidates. Um, we had, there was a movement called No Labels that looked like it was going to be uh, a big deal for a while. It kind of fizzled out, but the 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 big elephant in in the third party room right now is uh, Robert F Kennedy Jr. At this point, he's on the ballot in exactly one state, which is Utah, but he does have a fairly robust operation uh, to get on the ballot in all 50 states or close to it. And if he can do that, you know, he, he, he can shake up the race in, in ways that are very difficult to predict. And a lot of times with third party candidates, you can sort of predict where the votes are gonna come from. And you know, that's a, the whole concept of the votes coming from somewhere is controversial in and of itself. Uh, because the major parties are obviously not entitled to anybody's vote, and if somebody chooses to vote against them, like are they, is that, is that person, is that candidate stealing the vote? Um, but you know, with the Green Party, you can assume that those voters, if they voted, and the Green Party candidate wasn't there, would have been more likely to vote for the Democrat and the Libertarian for the Republican. Um, RFK seems to be taking from both sides. It's kind of difficult to determine how he might impact the um, election as a whole. But it's important to keep in mind that, I mean, Joe Biden won Arizona by 10,432, I think, votes. Uh, you know, that's just out of uh, more than 3 million. I mean, it's just, it's, a, um, it's a, just an infinitesimal margin, and it doesn't take that many voters um, who maybe voted for Biden in 2020 to decide they're going to vote for RFK to flip that outcome. Consequently, you know, same with, with Trump. If he's um, picking up support over here but losing it over here to RFK, you know, it, um, it, 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 they don't have to win to impact the election. And one of the twists, you know, to that point, right, of, of this campaign is I think you're seeing both the Trump campaign and the Biden campaign kind of more outwardly strategizing around this. I think in previous years, third parties were kind of written off as like, eh, they're the fringe, they're kooky. Um, I think both campaigns are taking, both major party campaigns are taking this uh, seriously. And, and that's, you know, one of the interesting things in, in terms of coverage, we have to think about covering these campaigns head on, but also how the other campaigns are interacting with them. Um, and then I think more broadly, just, uh, why, you know, why is there this dis dissatisfaction flowing through our politics right now? And what is that, this, this frustration with both major parties, regardless of, you know, uh, uh, of, of kind of what the results will be in November? What is, what is fueling that? Given what you've said about third party candidates and, and this one in particular, how ha has that affected 
how you cover him and that campaign, I, if at all. Do you, do you cover uh, RFK Jr. any differently than you would if you were on the Trump or Biden beat? Not really, no. Um, you know, he's a candidate just like the others. Um, he, I guess I, I ask a question of everybody that I talk to who is an RFK supporter that I probably wouldn't ask of a Biden or a Trump supporter, which is if he doesn't make the ballot in your state, will you vote for Biden or Trump? Um, just, to, you know, obviously it's anecdotal and anecdotes aren't data, but just kind of get some sense of um, where that support is coming from. Um, but other than that, you know, he's he's any other candidate. I want to know, um, you know, what what he believes about the issues, and I want to know what where what the voters think of him, what they like about him, what turns them off about him. All of those same things that that um, we'd want to know about the major candidates as well. And I think we ask the same questions. You know, where where are they getting their money? How are they spending their money? How many people are showing up at these events? How are they communicating to the voters they have, the voters they want? Uh, how are they shifting their message as they talk to different slices of the electorate, and what is that telling us? I think those are all things that we're looking at here with, with any candidate, and including in, in his case. I, say one, one, I mean, one of the interesting things about um, RFK in particular is just the, um, the, the, the he's, he's getting his word out through alternative means, like he, um, He's reaching a large audience through social media, through podcasts, through YouTube, um, and that's he's he's built up um, an audience in a big way through those sort of alternative platforms to the mainstream media, and it's it's uh, important to be looking in those spaces um, to understand sort of the the movement and 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 what he's saying in in, in those spaces. We've, uh, if I recall, already identified Donald Trump as the elephant in the room. Um, so I, I, I want to push that line of thinking and questioning a, a little bit more. Uh, and, and while this may overlap with some uh, ground we've already covered, uh, how has he and all of that uniqueness about him, including being a, a criminal defendant in court this week, um, how has that changed the equation, the, the tactics, the strategies that you use for political reporting? And, and, and let me go ahead and, and throw one other thing out here if I can ask you uh, to react. This is something I read in a piece uh, last week where someone wrote, Trump is not a normal candidate despite how the media often cover him. Are the media covering him, generally speaking, from what you've seen? in a less than ideal way? I'll start with the second question first. Um, I think on the whole, I actually think, I'm gonna defend the media, I think we do a, we do a great job and there is a wide variety of ways that we cover this very unique political figure. Um, you know, I think sometimes when people get frustrated they might be cherry picking a particular story but I don't think we have ever written so much about any political figure ever, and everything that this man does is being covered and, and that has, we have dived into. Uh, you know, he's got the criminal side, he's got his businesses, he's now the, a, he's got a publicly traded company that adds a whole new reporting line of potential, uh, you know, legal entanglements, financial entanglements. He's got a political movement. It's not just his campaign, but his influence on state political parties. He has changed so much in American politics since he came down the escalator in 2015. Um, and I think from, from a reporting standpoint, uh, you know, one of the biggest things has just been the volume of news that he makes. There are just more angles that we have to cover. I mean, like Stephen could probably tell you how, how, how many reporters at AP in different departments, business reporters, court reporters, have at some point been covering this story because this man just makes so much news. Um, and that's news he might not want to make. There's the news he intends to make. He knows how to control a news cycle. He uses social media, and he did this as, as president. He'd fire off a tweet, and we would be, oh, is this international policy? You know, we have to react to this. We have to report on this. What is happening? Is, this, is the government behind this? Um, so we've had less sleep. <laughs> There's more people involved. I think one of the big things has been, um, you know, in the past with politicians, 
they've always had maybe a fuzzy relationship with the truth, or they'd be prone to exaggeration. But we've never had a political figure who has so little, uh, such a casual relationship with the truth, and no shame about being very publicly disproven to be lying or exaggerating or just misstating things or not understanding how something works. And I do think that we are, you know, I think we uh, think about language a, uh, a lot, uh, you know, in this era. Um, and being specific, and you know, if there are lies, we call them lies, right? But we also add to that, um, you know, wh why that's lie, wh the context. Um, you know, th the election was was not stolen. Joe Biden was the legitimate winner of the 2020 presidential election, um, and you know, I'm sure JJ and Michelle and I could repeat, uh, you know, almost a verbatim language that we often use. Uh, you know, the context around that though of um, you know, the, the uh, court cases, including by judges that Trump uh, himself appointed, rejecting his, uh, his legal cases in 2020, his own attorney general, rejecting claims of election fraud. I think that we bring that context in, um, you know, uh, I, I think uh, 10, 15 years ago, there was a real kind of debate, can you call a politician a liar? That, you know, can you say that they lied? I think we have moved beyond that at this point. There, the, there are things that are said that are just not accurate, right? And, um, you know, one of the things I, if, if something is, is wrong, we will, we will say that it's wrong, but one of the things I, I try to focus on is the context around that, not just kind of throw by, you know, drive by labels, an election denier. Well, what does that mean, right? Like bringing in the context of, you know, of, of why the election was, was legitimate. And again, people may, you know, to the point we were talking about earlier, people may still disagree and, and that's okay. But hopefully by reading or listening or however they, they consumed that, that, uh, that journalism, they had to contend with, with the facts around that issue. I think we've had to be much more aggressive in how we convey that to people. You know, it's not just, you know, I remember actually as, when I was a Cronkite student, I did a program with the Arizona Republic called the AZ Fact Check. And like once a week, we'd go look at statements that, that political figures had said, and we'd go fact check them. And it would run as like a little sidebar in the paper. We have to, like that has to be in every story. If something, if something false was said, if a lie was said, something was just inaccurate, right below that, right above that, we need to say that was false and here's why. But we also will write an entire separate story exploring that. We'll link to that. We'll link to the underlying documents so that people can see for themselves why that was the way it was. And I think that's all the more important with if the fractured news environment we have. There are things that are on video that played out on cable news that people don't believe happened. So the only thing we can do is to just keep providing the facts and the context for them to look it up themselves and make the judgment for themselves. We, you know, we get a consistent message from, you know, from Stephen and, and from all of our managers that like, obviously we want to be fast. Um, that's part of journalism, but um, we never want to rush to the wire without knowing what the truth is. So if there is a claim and we aren't certain of what um, is true or not, and that claim, you know, is is crucial to the story, then, you know, we're going to figure that out before we publish, even if we we sit on it. And I think that that um, culture is really important um, and that directive. Um, and I would also say that I think that a lot of the criticism of how the media covers Trump, and certainly, you know, I, I'm, I don't mean to defend every story that's ever been written about him, but um, uh, I think there's a lot of frustration among people who don't like Trump that he gets so much coverage. And I think that some of the best journalism that we've seen since Watergate has been, um, you know, I, I, I think journalists are doing some of the best, you know, political journalism that we've seen since Watergate. And I think it's, um, important to sort of keep in mind that all of the things that, you know, if you, if you don't like Donald Trump, all the things that you know about him that make you not like him, you know, a huge portion of those were, um, you, you know, told to you by, by journalists doing journalism. And so you end up with a large volume of, of, of stories um, that, you know, makes it feel like he's, he's dominant. I mean, he is dominating the news cycle, but I think that perspective is important. In spite of that excellent point, uh, I do want to uh, play devil's advocate and where better else to do that in Home of the Sun Devils. I uh, want to play devil's ad advocate with something you said, Michelle, and 
at least to some extent, and that is you, you pointed out how many things that Trump does, and uh, I, I don't know if I'm quoting you perfectly, but some, so you said something like everything is covered. Some would say that's part of the problem, that the beast is being fed too much, that he plays off of the media and media coverage one way or the other, and some critics have said that the amount of coverage of him, and maybe others for that matter, needs to be tempered. I, we have received that criticism. We've also, it has shifted this year. Um, we've gotten a lot of criticism that we're not covering him enough, that people have forgotten what he was like as president, that we're not doing enough to quote him, that we're not capturing all 90 minutes of his speeches, which are 90 minutes usually, which is a lot to put in a story. Um, so I, I think there are always, there are always gonna be critics. I think, I, I'm not gonna defend every story, I think, but we are constantly reevaluating the way we cover it, what we're looking at, um, and I think, on the whole, I still feel like we, we are doing a great job. You know, I think there are ways to look at, you know, we talk about how, how he, he might use, he drive the news cycle. Um, as an example, he will show up to UFC events. He, like, he is friends with one of the owners of UFC, he will show up, he'll get a great big roar from the crowd, he'll raise his fists, he looks very popular. There are people who, there are, there are journalists at various publications who will just write, Donald Trump shows up, great big crowd. One of the things that we look at as we are covering things he, he does, we might not cover that, we might not cover every you know, UFC appearance, but we look at why is he doing this? Why is he putting this out there? Well, you know, in our reporting we find out that these moments, they think they go viral, they go on TikTok. That's one of the ways that the campaign is trying to reach younger voters because it looks cool. He's with a sport that has a lot of younger viewers. There is a tactic behind it. So the story for us as we're trying to approach it is why is he doing what he's doing? Why is he trying to communicate this? Not look at this cool thing that happened that's really neat, but what, what's the thinking behind this? And there's a balance here, right? And it's, it's imperfect, but I think that, um, you know, over the past decade, essentially, that, that he's been in, in political life, there's been an evolution in kind of how journalists are approaching this. I think we are past the days of, you know, uh, TV airing empty podiums, Trump coming soon, right? Um, you know, but we are six-ish months out from an election. He is a major party nominee. He could be president. What he says matters. And I think that, and what he does matters. I think it's incumbent on us to connect the dots, though, on why it matters, um, and not to just kind of Donald Trump said this in the same way. You know, I hope we don't just do Joe Biden said X or Y. That we connect it to why this is important to to voters, to the overall campaign. Um, you know, uh, I don't think we're writing off of you know tweets the way um, or, or covering you know tweets instantaneously the way um, the way uh, initially um, and you know when when he left the White House for a little while I think that things you know when he was just a former president we we weren't covering every single public utterance in the same way that we don't cover every public utterance by George W. Bush or Barack Obama when he became a presidential candidate again when he became a front runner and now a nominee I do think that our our approach has you know we have to take that seriously. I think one other thing, one lesson we've learned too is that things that in the moment might seem, I don't want to say trivial, but they might seem like they, they, there's news that day. Uh, we have learned that you know, six months, a year later, that could be the basis of an indictment. That, could, that actually matters a lot, that somebody was there to record it and write what happened, that those things, you know, journalists being there to witness it, to take photos, to have it on video. There are a lot of times we have to go back and look at what he said someday in 2017 because it's part of the policy he's rolling out now. Um, that I think just having a contemporary record, again, for someone who was president and who could be president again, the vital record keeping that journalism does, I think that's at play here as well. Let me re remind uh, those here, and thank you for being here, uh, that we're happy to take questions. Uh, if, if you have one, please uh, step up to the microphone in the center aisle and uh, we'll be happy to uh, entertain what, you, uh, what you're curious about. Uh, in the meantime, um, I'll ask this. In, in journalism and journalism school, uh, the preaching and teaching include things like fairness, balance, objectivity, impartiality, neutrality. Um, 
I, I may deal with a couple of those more specifically in a minute, but my, my question for now is about the danger of what aboutism. How do we try to avoid that? How do you try to avoid that? I think you focus on <clears throat> the story that's in front of you. Um, you know, like if, if um, I'm trying to think of specific examples, but um, you, you, the what about story, if I'm writing about something that happened today, I'm going to, you know, focus on that and the truth and the facts around that. And uh, the other story for about the other candidate, you know, we are covering that as well. And you can't let the, well, what about he did it to um, distract from the story in front of you. At the same time, a huge area of journalism to explore around that is, is what is different about these cases? Uh, you know, why was Trump indicted for, um, his classified, for, for having classified documents in his home when Biden wasn't? And, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of facts around that, and, um, you know, it's, that's an important story to explore. And this is the, you know, centrality of explanatory journalism uh, in this era. You know, I, the, we, I think the the classified documents uh, cases with with Biden and Trump are a perfect example. Um, you know, they're they are different cases. The way that each person, the way that Trump and Biden responded to uh, the discovery of classified documents, um, were just vastly different, right? And that and resulted in different outcomes. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of noise, and I think you try to cut through that and break it down. Here's why this happened. Here's why it's different or, or not different than the other. And, and um, I, I just always I go back to like just cutting through that noise. I want to uh, focus on maybe two of those values that I, I mentioned a second ago, and that's objectivity and, and neutrality. Uh, there is a school of thought that they are distinctly different, so much so that one of them, objectivity, they say should be a goal in reporting, whereas neutrality should be uh, avoided. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, what Christian Amanpour said once, is be truthful, not neutral, implying, of course, that being neutral is not being truthful. Um, and I'm wondering how you see this issue, this distinction between objectivity and neutrality. I don't think I spend a lot of time thinking with every action, like, am I being objective, am I being neutral? I think as a journalist, we're biased for the truth. And I think we have to look to where the facts take us. And we write what we know. I think part of being fair, which is a key part of journalism, is to present to people, especially when we're writing critically, this is what I've got. Explain to me why I'm wrong. Tell me your piece. This is coming. Like, giving them time to respond. Um, and checking your own assumptions, I think, is, is a vital part of that. It's, a, it's the skill you would do in any, any area of journalism, but going where the facts take you and talking to a wide variety of people, getting their perspectives, what am I missing, and laying out the facts to people, I think just that's, that's bias for the truth, and that's how I think we need to approach our jobs as we're, as we're checking our assumptions as we go into these things. I tend to think about fairness more than, than anything else. Um, I think we can get trapped with the objectivity debate. Um, you know, look, we're humans. We all, everybody on this stage comes to our job every day with our life experiences. And I think that's important and okay to acknowledge. But that doesn't mean that because I have a particular life experience that I can't think about, is, am I being fair to this campaign? Have we given them time to respond? Have we leveled with them about what this story is gonna say? If we haven't, then we need to press pause. And I don't care if we're talking about the Trump campaign or the Biden campaign um, or, or any other campaign, a Senate campaign, whatever. And so I care a lot more about that. I, 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 you know, I think objectivity and neutrality, like you, you can kind of, kind of end up in this place of like the view from nowhere, which is um, I don't think helpful uh, and, and I don't think is a standard that is all that achievable. Yeah, and I just want to put a finer point on something that they both said um, <clears throat> that well, fairness is not, um, does not mean both sides. It's not, we don't mean, f when we say fair, we don't mean that uh, you're going to 
give equal space to the opposing view regardless of you know its relevance or truthfulness or whatever. Um, fair means that nobody learns what you're accusing them of by reading your story. You know, you give them an opportunity to um, give you the context you don't understand to explain. Um, that's what we mean by by fairness. It's not um, both sides. It's not equalness or neutrality. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, moving closer to home, at least <laughs> for those of us who call Arizona home. Uh, what kind of role do you see this state playing? in politics this year uh, with the presidential campaign, with Arizona's own races, and especially, let me ask this, especially in light of the state Supreme Court's uh, now famous ruling of, uh, what was it, one or two weeks ago now on the 1864 uh, abortion law. That one's probably for me. Jay, you are going to be our expert on this. Um, well, I think um, that Arizona is the center of the political universe, and you know, one of our colleagues, Steve Peoples, and I wrote that story on Friday that um, this abortion ruling, um, you know, is and we're a border state. You know, these are the two issues that the two campaigns want to focus on, um, and they are you know front and center right here in Arizona. Um, so, you know, this was the, by percentage, the second closest state um, in the 2020 election. By number of votes, it was the closest state. Um, Georgia's the other one. Um, and it's going to be super close again. There's a Senate race uh, that, you know, could be crucial in determining um, which party controls the Senate. Um, we've got, you know, there's 17 U.S. House districts where um, Biden... Uh, where they were represented by Republicans, but Biden won the district. Two of those 17 are in Arizona. Um, the legislature is up for grabs. Um, there's from the very top of the ballot all the way down to the very bottom of the ballot where the abortion um, question will be. Um, Arizona is in the middle of it all, and what is decided here will have national implications, and I'm really curious what the folks who do not live in Arizona have to say about it. Well, first of all, I'll just say I hope that JJ wasn't planning like a big European vacation in the next few months, because uh, that won't be. <laughs> Sorry, Jenna. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, I do think that, uh, you know, uh, this is, this is going to be central to the campaign, to both campaigns. Um, and it's one of the reasons I'm really glad, you know, one of the things I love about the AP is that JJ is here, right? He, and and living here and is not kind of, you know, diving in from New York or DC, that this is one of the things that I think will will um, distinguish the coverage this year that that uh, that we have a, a resident expert. I would just add, you know, for student journalists, this is a very rich environment. If you're at all interested in covering politics and government, there are boatloads of stories this year. Um, from the presidential on down, you know, I think one thing, you know, seeing the dynamics at play here, you know, who's on the county boards, who's, who's picking the judges that, for the Supreme Court who make these decisions. We know the actions of the legislature, how they can impact what is happening now and how that's impacting a presidential race. Uh, JJ and I have both covered state legislatures. We've seen the way that those, uh, the way the lawmakers there, that they can calculate as to how um, you know, like we, we had politicians back in 2015, 2014, who in their, in their different state legislatures were discussing wanting to pass abortion laws in their states that they knew were unconstitutional because they wanted it to be the test case that overturned Roe. That, that legislatures think in ways of their context in the national fabric. And those are all ripe opportunities for reporting as they, as they are looking down the road and they're talk, legislatures are talking to each other. I just cover your local government, get interested in it. There's, there's tons of stories there, and, and the impacts are actually national from what's happening locally. I don't think the words misinformation and disinformation have specifically come up yet. If, if they have, I stand corrected. But if we can touch on that uh, for, for a bit here, um, as we know, politicians and campaigns have always used spin. Uh, of one kind or another, they massage and, and manipulate the facts. How is this current age of misinformation and disinformation different, if at all, and how do you deal with it as a reporter in the field? Uh, well, 
I don't know that those words specifically came up, but we, what, the word that I did hear a lot and said a lot is truth. Um, and so that is ultimately our North Star. That's what we're going after. And so whether that is distinguishing truth from lies, truth from misinformation, truth from disinformation, you know, ultimately what, what we're after is understanding, um, you know, the, the, the truth of what happened or, or what was said um, or, you know, what the facts are or whatever and reporting that. Um, you know, what's different this year is that, you know, the rise of deep fakes, um, you know, the technology around, um, you know, v being able to create just completely fake videos is, is scarily good. And, um, you know, we're, we're expecting that, you know, we're, we're going to need to be on the lookout for that. And, um, you know, that's part of that conversation about slowing down and, and understanding what we're um, looking at and, um, you know, reaching out. Uh, in, in fairness, to give a op campaign an opportunity to say, you know, that <laughs> that's a deep fake that never happened. Um, you know, uh, all of that comes into play. You know, there was, I, I, when you say this, JJ, I'm thinking back to, I, it was one of the first indictments. I, I, I think it was the New York indictment. Uh, in, uh, was that just last year? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, and, and there were these images uh, on social media of of Trump um, kind of being pursued by police, and they looked really convincing, and um, you know it was such a good example of like you know <laughs> it didn't really ring true. It was like really, do you think that police are gonna like chase a former president through the streets of New York? But like it, you know it 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 um, you know it was one of those things that's just like circulating out there, and then people start retweeting, and it kind of takes on a life of its own. And it's just one small example of just stop. Breathe. Does this make sense? <laughs> I think I think one of the bigger challenges we have too that it's not just campaigns and the people supporting them who put out misinformation or disinformation. There's just random people. There are foreign governments that have motivations here, that have sophisticated technology. I think the volume of what's what's out there and what is being created is is just something we have to just stay ever vigilant at, like as it as it evolves. And I think as journalists. Part of our job is to be aware of those new technologies, to know that, oh, that's a thing that could be faked or manipulated too, and to just be aware of what those messages are. Because if we ignore them and we think, well, that's, that's ridiculous or that's crazy, there are people who will believe that, that we have learned that. Um, I think the Pizzagate incident in, was it 2016? That people believe that there was a pizza shop that was operating as a secret child sex trafficking operation like it resulted in somebody showing up there with a gun. That there are there are responsible ways to investigate. I'm not saying we need to write a Pizzagate story, but um, we need to look at everything seriously and look at is it taking off? Do we need to quickly explain why this is faked or examine it? Um, you know, I think we had just done a really great story recently about uh, the misinformation in foreign languages too. Um, that. Uh, or even the you know, Spanish speakers, that there's misinformation on uh, certain apps for certain audiences. Like there are just volumes of misinformation that we haven't seen in the past that we need to be aware of. In closing, if I can ask uh, all three of you about your journey from college, ASU for two of you, um, to the present, what has that taught you about the now and what lies ahead and within that context, what could you share with our student journalists? Um, I think journalism is, I, I don't think, I know, journalism is, um, you know, it, more important than it's ever been. I think we are going to have a unique and difficult campaign season coming up and we need as journalists need to you know stay focused on our principles on um, on fairness and accuracy and truth um, and you know I, I I think I was thinking about a lesson that uh, I wish that I had internalized earlier in my career which is that correcting your mistakes when you do make them obviously uh, you want to avoid mistakes as 
as much as you possibly can, but you do make them, we're all human. And when you do, correcting them adds to your credibility. It doesn't diminish it. And it sucks to have a story out there that you know, has at the top of it, this story has been corrected, and at the bottom of it, that says this story has been corrected. But um, failing to f correct your facts diminishes your own credibility, your news organization's credibility, and the entire industry's credibility over the long term. And um, it, it's so important to promptly and um, uh, transparently correct the record when you screw it up. And, and you won't probably make that mistake again when it's laid out that way. Um, I, would, I would add that I just, all the reporting you do, especially early in your career, it matters. It is part of the public record. It is furthering the cause of truth. It, it is important, and it might not feel like you're even on a big story, but it does matter. And the lessons you take from it, the way you learn to do that job, will absolutely inform the way you, you're doing your job as you go forward. And you learn what works, and you learn what doesn't. But those are all valuable experiences, and they are important for democracy, and they're important for the country. I think two things that come up for me, um, and Michelle kind of touches on this a little bit as well, just the centrality of reporting to your development as a journalist, regardless of what format you're in, what beat you're doing, whether it's entertainment, sports, politics, police, whatever it is that you're out doing, just the reporting and getting out you know, of your newsroom, um, of your home office, uh, getting away from the computer and talking to people. Um, I think it is, um, nothing replaces that. Um, and, and you will fine tune your reporting tactics as you develop in your career, but uh, but it's, it's vital, especially in the, those early stages of your career to just get out there and kind of figure it out a little bit, right? Um, there is no substitute for that. And then the final thing I would just say is, um, I think the role of humility, I just keep coming back to that word, of um, especially kind of how I do my job, how I um, think about politics, just, you know, not being in the know-it-all. Um, I don't know anything, <laughs> like, right? You know, ask questions, rely on your colleagues, find your allies uh, in your newsroom, in your, you know, in your own personal life who will kind of help uh, um, guide you, who will help tell you that you're wrong. Uh, you, you can't lose if you have that. I think be skeptical, but don't be cynical. Question your own assumptions. Um, and one other thing I would, anybody you deal with, anybody you come in contact with, they're gonna come back in your career at some point. So don't assume that if you have like a, a crappy encounter with them that you're done with that person. Like that person's career is going forward too. So just keep that in mind of people that you deal with early on that they're, they're gonna be in your life for a while. All great advice. Um, please join me in uh, thanking these great journalists and sharing their expertise with us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you for coming everyone. Thank you.